And we started in the book of Philippians. Where Paul said, be anxious for nothing. Something. Say nothing. Say nothing. Say nothing. Say nothing. He says, be anxious for nothing. But in all things, with prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And he says, if you, if you, if you can get to a place where you're anxious and worried, but when that anxiety and worry comes, if you turn that into prayer, then he says, I've got this amazing trade off what I'm going to do with you. And he calls it the peace of God. He says, if you do that and turn it into prayer, he says, the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, it's not something you whip yourself up into. It's not you thinking about the situation and rationalizing it to the point where you bring some kind of natural peace into your world. The problem with that is if one of your rationalizations suddenly changes, you lose the peace because then you've got to rationalize around the next thing. So he's not talking about some kind of peace you bring into your world. He's literally saying when you feel worry and anxiety, God's highest for you, not because your worry affects him. God is not getting ulcers because you're worried. God is at peace. God is in control. God knows what's going on. He knows the first chapter and the last chapter. He knows the start and the end. He's never been thrown into a spin because something happened on planet Earth where he went, my goodness, I shouldn't have taken a lunch break. Look what happens when you walk away. You know, they say that the, the, the mouse puts it when the cat leaves, the mouse play or something. That's never happened to God, never will happen to God. God is in absolute authority, absolutely in control. Amen? Is that true? I believe. Does anyone else here believe that this morning? God is in control. That gives me a great basis and platform for which I can endeavour to live a life where I can get my worries and anxieties under control. Because I know that there is a greater control. Am I on? No. Am I on now? So that whole time I wasn't even on. So... I hope the people watching the recording can mime. That was pretty good, by the way. But anyway, not getting it again. So, um, where was I? <laughs> by the way, Luke, that's your fault. You're the tech guy, not me. I don't claim to know tech. You should have said, turn it on. <laughs> Chloe, don't you ever pull that one with me and your mother. It's always your fault. Um, so God is in control. So because I have that faith, that God is out there because I have a faith that God, uh, the God who knows all things, who sees all things, who controls ultimately all things, because I believe in him, then even though I may feel out of control or like I don't understand or don't have all knowledge or can't work it out, I have a default that I can fall back on. And that is that God, you are good. I know the character and nature of my father and he's a good father, amen? He's a good God. And he's made a commitment to me just as I've made a commitment to him. And so he looks out for me and he loves me and he cares for me and he brings the best into my world and he's got a perspective of what's best that might be different to mine. We're going to talk a bit about that. But I trust God. So if you're in this room and you have faith in Jesus, you actually have the foundation set in your world where you can potentially live a life diminishing worry and anxiety and increasing peace and allowing God to get on the inside of you and bring you to a place where you understand and trust that even though you're out of control, even though you don't know, the one you serve does. Amen? The one you serve does. So we've been looking at, at that. We started in Philippians, and then we've moved on to Matthew 6. The goal is to get to Matthew chapter 6, where Jesus says, Therefore, I say to you, do not worry. Exactly. We're one week away from that. We're going to get there next year, next week. I still, I, I want to, I say that every week. Next week, we're going to get to Matthew 6, do not worry. But I just really want to lay a foundation because there's a lot in Matthew chapter 6 that is really the foundation so that when Jesus gets to that point to say to this crowd, Matthew chapter 6, the Sermon on the Mount, it's the longest recorded uh, uh, sermon message that Jesus preached. And that's because I think that Matthew felt like I can't leave any of this out. This all needs to be there. The Holy Spirit through Matthew felt like it all needs to be there because it's connected. It's connected. So we're not going to just pluck one verse out and go, hey, do not worry. And everyone walks away feeling condemned and guilty because you do worry about stuff, don't you? Jesus isn't saying it in a condemning way. He's not just plucking it out of the blue going, hey, here's a wild thought. Stop worrying, you bunch of sinners. Trust me. Now, he's laying a foundation and he's explaining around that so that when he gets there, they've got a logical kind of reason to go, you know what, I get it now. I understand what you're saying. So we've been looking at that. And if you, if you haven't heard those uh, messages, I haven't been here, go to the YouTube channel. You can catch up on that. What I want to do this week is just before we get into the meat of do not worry, 
There are two verses that are the bookends of this passage. And I want to just take a little bit of time this morning and just look at the two bookends or the frame. Then next week we'll dive into the main picture. Is that okay? So we're going to look at the frame. And the two verses are this, Matthew 6, 24. Jesus says this, No one, and in the actual Greek language it literally means um, nobody, like none. Now I know some of us think that we're the exception to... Anyone ever read the Bible and think you're the exception to the rule? Come on, I'm not the only one. We've read things and then gone, yeah, Jesus, I think you're right, but you don't really know me, Jesus. I mean, I can understand other people can't serve two masters, but I'm, I'm not just your average run-of-the-mill kind of person, you know. I'm a pastor. No, no, no. He makes it very clear, Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters. And again, that word masters is the word kurios. It's the same word used quite often of, of when they speak about Jesus as Lord. It's got that connotation of somebody that you're completely submitted to and that is over and above you. It's used in other contexts, many contexts, but it's used in that context too. It says, why can't you serve two masters? Well, here's the reason why. Because you're either going to hate one and love the other or be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and the word here is mammon. In some translations it says riches, some it'll say money. The actual word there, <coughs> translated mammon, it's only used four times in the New Testament. And, and it's not saying that money is evil, wealth is evil, riches is evil. What it, the only time it's ever referred to as mammon is any time that it's talking about riches, wealth and money that are being used in opposition to God. How many of you know that money is not in opposition to God? Yep, you can be rich in this place today and not be in opposition to God. Having said that, you can be the poorest person here financially without a, 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 a shoelace to tie and you can have what you do have in opposition to God. It would become mammon. It's got nothing to do with what you have or don't have. Um, it's not what he's saying. But that word mammon, it's only ever used to describe riches when they're in opposition to God. So don't think that having uh, material possessions or something is evil. Jesus never said that. It's not about what you have, it's what has you. What's got possession of you? You can have, you can have, it, you can, you can have as much, but what's holding you? It's not about, about what, what, uh, what's serving you. What are you serving? What are you serving? What comes first? This is what Jesus is saying. You can't serve two masters because there's going to be conflict. There's going to come a point. The second verse I want to quickly touch on is Matthew 6.33, which is the other bookend of the, this passage. And it says this, and we all know that, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things, all these things that I've just spoken about, that I'm going to talk, all these things will be added to you. So all these things aren't evil. God wouldn't add them to you if they were evil or wicked in and of themselves. So don't ever let anybody tell you that having a nice car or a home or whatever is, is wicked or evil or just because you happen to uh, end up in a job where you earn a great deal more money than the neighbour. It's, it's got nothing to do with that. It's about your heart and what possesses you. What are you serving? That's the point that he's making here. You can't serve two masters. In Matthew 6.33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be <coughs> added. Now we'll start with Matthew 6.24. Verse 24, it doesn't say that you can't um, have God and riches. Okay? It doesn't say you can't have God and riches. It doesn't say you can't want God and riches. How many people here, I'll, I'll be brutally honest with you, if I had the choice to be able to be the person God wants me to be and do what God wants me to do and earn $5,000 a week or be the person that, that God wants me to be and do the thing God wants me to do and earn $200 a week, I'll take the 5000 I will take the 5000 any day because I, will, I know that I could put that to good use and kingdom purpose. I'm not interested in building my own kingdom. Um, so there's nothing wrong with wanting to, to go, you know, I would love to have God, but I'd also love to have a pretty decent life down here on earth. Nothing wrong with that. Again, let's not, let's not be people that turn uh, 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 wealth or the blessing of God into something that's the complete opposite to what it was intended to be. And, and we have two extreme ends of the spectrum. One says that the blessings and all this stuff you have is proof. It's proof that you're godly and God, you know, that God's for you and you've done everything right. And that's the and you know what? That's that's people at that end. But then there are people at the other end that say if you have money and wealth and riches, it's proof that you're ungodly. 
because you must be chasing after that. You must be doing something wrong. It's got too much of a hold and a grip on your life when those people don't even know you. I remember before I became a Christian, walk, and, and I'm walking down the street westbound with a mate of mine. None of us were believers. We'd been to the beach. We're walking down Shores Bay area, and there was this house there. And it was really big, double story, and they had a pool on their roof. Oh, I had a pool on their roof. And I'll tell you what, I didn't miss the moment. I'm walking with my mate, and we got chatting about this particular house. And somehow in the conversation that came up, there's a house there, and, and it's a big house, and it's got a pool on the roof. And he said, and they're Christian, Christian people own that. Boy, I did not miss the opportunity. Straight away, I started for the rest of the walk. Oh, look at that, Christian's got a pool. And, and I just ran them down and, and, and cursed them and just began to tell my non-Christian mate, whom, by the way, I was not a Christian myself, so what would I know? But anyway, I'm lecturing him on how that's ungodly and God would never uh, bless a person that was following him and doing the right thing. And that's uh, this God they serve, he's not a God that blesses people that honour him. What a stupid, ridiculous idea. So there are people at both ends of the spectrum. It doesn't matter about that. What matters is your heart. Who are you serving? Who are you serving? What are you using those things that God brings into your world to do? Whose kingdom are you building? Are you building the kingdom of God? Is that in the front of your mind? Or are you just building the kingdom of self? Are you just doing whatever it is that you want to do? And that's a question that you need to sit before the Lord and ask. No one can judge you. No one can look at you and go, because you're affluent, you must be this or you must be that. I don't know your heart. You don't know mine. But, but, but you can sit with God and you can ask the Lord, God, could you show me? God, could you open my eyes to actually see my heart? Would you be prepared to do that? By the way, that's not just for people with stuff. People without stuff do the same thing. God, search my heart. Search my heart. This is not... You can't have God and riches or want it. He says you can't serve them both. You can't have two masters. The issue is not what you have, but what has you. It's not what serves you, but what you serve. It's not what you possess, but what possesses you. Ultimately, who or what are you most loyal to with the time you have down here? You cannot live your life prioritizing both. There comes a time in everybody's life, this is what Jesus is saying, there'll come a time in everybody's life where the true priority will come out. Amen? You ever have that moment? That, that you, you're, you're going through life and we feel like we can serve this and we can serve that and we can have a foot in the world and a foot in the kingdom and then something happens in our life. A defining moment, some people might call it, where we're confronted with the reality and it happens all the time, doesn't it? It can happen on a daily basis. You're confronted with the reality of which kingdom am I serving? Who, which master am I serving? I'm sitting in the lunchroom and somebody brings out that magazine and plops it on the table in front of me. What do I do in that moment? Who do I serve? Do I just sit there and look at it and just be one of the boys? Or do I take a stand and go, you know what? That's not me. I'm not into that. If that's you, that's fine. It's not me. And in that moment, I'm serving the kingdom. In that moment, I'm, I've chosen who I'm serving in that moment. I'm serving God. I'm not serving self. I'm not serving the crowd. It happens all the time. We have those defining moments in our life. I remember when we lived in India um, years ago, and uh, a friend of ours that we worked with, he went uh, into a particular village, and they planted a church in this village. And uh, this family had given their life to Christ. And what happened was uh, they gave this family a Bible. And in India, uh, because you know, there are so many gods, Indians actually have a joke uh, amongst them, that, uh, and they're proud of it, that uh, in years to come, there'll be as many gods as people in India. We can all have our own god. That's how many gods. There's millions of gods. And uh, so anyway, when a lot of people get saved, they give their life to Christ. In India, it's, it, it, it's not uncommon that they will then take Jesus and put him on the shelf at home with all the other gods. This happens quite a bit. And there's a philosophy behind why you don't just charge in like a, a bull at a gate. Uh, but I'll get into that another time. But what happened in this situation was this, these friends of ours gave them a Bible. They took the Bible home and they put the Bible on the shelf. And the Bible was up on the shelf surrounded by all these idols. That night, that wall of the house caught on fire. And the whole wall burnt down. They had to leave the house. The next day, they came back to the house, the place where they were living, and it was all burnt down. And they went over to where the altar was, and it was just charred remains, and every idol had burnt. The Bible was sitting there on the shelf, unburnt, untouched. They picked it up, didn't even smell of smoke. Now, that's a kind of defining moment, don't you reckon? 
That's a moment where you're going to have to go, okay, who am I going to serve here? The job was made a little bit easier by the fact that you couldn't even smell smoke on the Bible. But you've got to make those decisions. And every one of us get confronted by those moments in our life where if we haven't decided who we're going to serve, we'll just serve by default whatever's convenient in the moment. I don't believe as Christians that we're meant to serve the convenient default. We're meant to make the choice. Who will we serve? Reminds me of Joshua 24, I think it is. Remember where Joshua gathered Israel and he said, you know, uh, uh, choose this day. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. It, it was, it's not like I feel like it. I feel like I'm going to serve God. No, no, it was, what he said was it's a choice. It's like worship. Worship's not a feeling. It's a choice, isn't it? It's a choice we make to go, I'm going to just push everything aside. I'm going to focus on God. And, and even though I don't feel like it, Psalm 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me, bless his holy name. In other words, my soul doesn't feel like it. My soul doesn't want to make this choice, but I'm speaking to my own soul saying, hey, soul, get up. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Forget not his benefits. He's talking to himself saying, self, make the choice to worship. And, and the decision to serve God wholeheartedly, and that's what Matthew chapter 6 is about. It's a picture, a portrait that Jesus is painting of what wholehearted devotion and full-hearted commitment to Jesus Christ, this is what it looks like. This is what it looks like. This is what it looks like. And it starts with the choice. Who will you serve? Which master do you choose to bow your knee to? When I was a kid, I... My, my parents broke up when I was fairly young. I think I would have been... They, they got together and separated, got together and separated as long as I can remember. But I was 12 years old when the final shift happened. And I remember getting in a, a car and we drove to um, St. Mary's in the western suburbs of Sydney where my nana was living. And we drove to my nana's house for Christmas. And I remember, still remember as vivid as anything, going into the house and we're sitting there, Christmas tree here. It was the day before Christmas, uh, Christmas Eve night, 24th of December. And my mother walked into the lounge room and said to me and my sister, who was six years younger than me, come with me. We got up, we're sitting there, there's tinsel and trees. We got up, we walked into the laundry and here was my father in tears crying. My mother looked at me and she said, I'm leaving him, that's it. You pick, you decide who you're going to go with. You decide which was so unfair for a 12-year-old to have to make that decision, and much more unfair for my six-year-old sister to go through that. Children shouldn't have to go through that. But she looked me in the eye and she just said, you pick. That's a decision I shouldn't have to make. Here's the thing, I wanted to go with both. I really did. I wanted both of them. But I was in a position where I couldn't have both. And it's a little bit like that. With You can't serve two masters. You've got to make the decision. And you know what? Most of us as believers, we want both, don't we? If we're brutally honest, deep down in our heart, if we're brutally honest, most of us want both. Most of us want both. If I go fully over here and serve God, what does that look like for me here? What does that mean? We're very blessed in the West. We, haven't, we don't go through too much persecution and all that sort of stuff. But I've been in nations and, and, and seen believers who the minute they give their life to Christ, the minute they answer that question, who am I going to serve? And they start serving Jesus. All of a sudden, they can't wash at the community watering hole. They can't drink from the community well. They've got to walk five kilometers carrying a bucket just to get water for their family. Many are beaten. Many have been killed. Many have had their houses burned down. Many of them can't shop because they won't take their money because they're, they've decided to serve somebody else. But when we make a decision to serve uh, one master... Of course, there are always consequences on the other side of the fence. But, but he, he, here's what I want you to think about in terms of, uh, of, of no one can serve two masters. Who are you going to serve? Here's what I want you to think of. Most of the time when we think of serving a master, it conjures up this negative image. And the negative image is serve well or else. When we think of serving a master, we think of the master as being somebody that's, that's bearing down upon the servant and there's going to be some kind of negative consequence if you don't. That's generally the image that people think of with servant and master. But there's another side to the argument, and I think that's what Jesus is getting at in the bigger context. It's this. You need to choose your master because that's the one you become dependent upon to meet your needs. The one you serve, the one you submit yourself to that becomes your master has a responsibility to meet the basic needs of the servant. Because if the servant is meeting the needs of the master then the master meets the needs of the servant. It's in the master's best interests to meet the needs of the servant. So you need to choose who you want to serve because whoever you choose to serve, they're the one you become dependent upon 
for the meeting of your needs. Who do you want meeting your needs? Yourself? Your culture? The crowd? Or do you want God to be the one that you're dependent upon to meet your needs? Well, it starts by first deciding who will you serve? Because the master meets the basic needs of the servant. Luke 15, chapter 17, illustrates this really, really well. Everyone know the story of the prodigal son? The prodigal son decides that he will take his inheritance and go and manage his own life with his inheritance. His inheritance was rightfully his. It wasn't the right time. It was very disrespectful the way he did it. But he got a hold of his inheritance. He thought it would be better to manage his own, to, to, to manage his own inheritance and to look after himself that way than depend on the, 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 the father who actually wanted to meet his needs. And so he ran off with his inheritance and so on. And here's what happens. We all know the story. He gets to this moment where he's sitting there and he's feeding pigs. Everyone remember the story? He's feeding these pigs, sitting there at a pig pen, feeding these pigs. And he has an epiphany, and the epiphany takes him back home to his father. But here's what I want you to see. The first part of that epiphany, in in Luke 15, Luke records it this way, verse 17. But when he came to himself, here's the first thing he said to himself. How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. The first thing that came to his mind that got him on the journey of going back and submitting himself to his father was the reality that, you know what, my father provides the needs of the people that serve him. My father actually provides their needs. My father looks after them so much so that his servants, his slaves, they've got not only enough for themselves, but they've got enough left over to bless others. That's the kind of father, that's the kind of of provider that the father was. He provides so much so for the servants, yet here I am, a son. And the first thing that got his attention was this issue of provision. He actually looks after, a good master looks after his servants. A good master will look after his servants. And that was enough for him to begin the journey to go back home because he sat there looking at pig food, eating pig food, basically going, you know what, I took my inheritance and I'm trying to meet my own needs and it's never enough. It doesn't work. For some reason, it doesn't calculate two plus two is not equaling four. That here I have with everything I wanted, my own inheritance, run off, I've got control of it. I'm doing what I want, doing what I think is best. But these guys are back here, I guess in one sense, subservient and doing what they're told, but all their needs are met. Isn't that interesting? All their needs are met. The first thing that got him on that train of thought was realizing that, Providing wise, I've got nothing here, I'm failing. Those guys back there are getting looked after because that's what a good master does. A good master provides for the needs of his servants. A good master looks after the servants. There are far too many sons and daughters of God who are still believing in the myth of their own self sufficiency and missing out on the fullness of the relationship that God wants with them. Not just to know him, but you know what, to go that one step further and to begin to trust him to begin to trust him. We can trust him with an eternal salvation. We can trust him with an eternity we can't see. But God wants us to trust him with the day-to-day things we can see. That's, That's our father. That's the relationship he wants. He wants you to be able to trust him today, right now, for whatever it is you're worried about, concerned about, anxious about. He wants you to not only just know him, but know him and get to the point where you can trust him with now, not just for later. Not just for later. This is what he's going to go into. Jesus is going to go into some real basic stuff here in Matthew 6. He's going to talk about your basic needs of life. And he's going to say, therefore, don't worry. You can trust me. And he's trying to paint a picture here going, you can trust me to meet your needs, but you've got to, you've got to make me your master. If you serve me, this is the byproduct of that. If you want to serve yourself, go hard. See how long it lasts. I tried it for many years. It doesn't work. I tried serving myself for many years and I found myself at 19 years of age sitting up in a caravan thinking very, very clearly in my head, if this is all there is to life, Alan, why don't you go and end it? I was popular. I was sporty. I, I, I you know, thought I could 
thought I had everything I needed, thought I had everything I wanted, and guess what? What I thought I had that I needed, turns out that it wasn't enough. How do I know that? Because if it was enough, I wouldn't have sat up in bed and had that thought. I wouldn't have begun that journey going, I need to seriously find something here because if I don't find something, I could check myself out of this life. You don't do that when your basic needs are being met, when the deepest needs of your heart are met. You don't think like that. My needs weren't being met, but I tried it all myself. The second bookend to this, and it ties in, is Matthew 6.33. He says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Here's a couple of things that Jesus legitimizes in this bookend, this statement. Number one, he legitimizes the idea that you've got actual needs. Who knows that you have actual needs? We actually do have needs. There's nothing wrong with having actual, genuine needs. Everybody has them. And Jesus is saying here that if you seek first the kingdom of God, he says, I'm going to add these things to you. I know, the, I know you have legitimate needs. I know you have things. I know that just waiting for heaven is not, not the be-all and end-all. I know that before heaven, you're going to have things that you need right down here on earth. I know you're going to have legitimate needs. And I'm concerned for more than just when you get to heaven. I'm concerned for you now. That's like saying, I'm only going to be concerned for my kids when they turn 18 and get out of the home. No, no, no. I'm concerned for them all the time. I'm concerned for them. I'm as concerned for my children when they were one years of age than I am right now with a 25-year-old son. I have the same concern and the same desire to provide and to meet their needs where applicable and possible and appropriate at their different ages, but the same desires, it hasn't changed. It's not like I wait till they're 18 and leave home and that's all I care about. I care about the whole journey, the whole process. And God cares about life this side of heaven, not just that side. Not just there. He wants to be a part of your world and he wants to care for your needs. He wants to care for the legitimate needs you have. That word um, where it says um, uh, those things will be added to you. Seek first the kingdom of God and all those things will be added. It's an interesting word. It's the same Greek word where we get our word prosthetic from today. You know prosthetic? Prosthetic. And what do you do when you get a prosthetic? Well, a prosthetic is we actually give you something that you legitimately need. You don't go and say, and I know you wanted to, many mothers here have probably gone, I'd love to go and get a prosthetic third and fourth arm. So I'm ra- anyone want that? I'm raising my kids. I would love a third and a fourth arm. I don't need it. It's not normal, natural, it's not, but I just would love a prosthetic third and fourth arm so I can be holding up a nappy, changing a bottle, uh, making my husband's dinner, whatever. I'm, I'm not saying you need to do that, but I'm just saying all the jobs that you've got to do or that you do do, you just, I'd love an extra arm. How many men would love another set of, another head so we could think about two things at once instead of one? I was at home yesterday and I'm trying to put, I'm thinking about a shelf being put up. Chloe's asking me a question. Jackie's asking me a question. Her mother's up there, Valley, and she's asking me a question. I ended up just stopping looking at everyone and going, one at a time. One at a time, please have mercy. I'm but a man. A humble man. But you don't get prosthetic wants, you get prosthetic needs. Things that you legitimately need, that's what you add. And that's what Jesus is saying. Seek me first. Here's the thing. Seek me first and and all the things you genuinely need will be added to you. Now, here's the problem. Here's the problem. What do you genuinely need? What do we genuinely need? Because Jesus made the promise. Serve me. Make me your master wholeheartedly. Go about my business. And I'm going to meet all of your needs. The question we've got to ask ourselves is, what's a need? What's an actual need? How many people are running around out there going, yeah, did the Christian thing, tried it, prayed for a girlfriend, didn't get it. So I forget God. I prayed for a thousand dollars to buy this and I didn't get it. So where's God? Prayed for, prayed for healing. Prayed for someone to be healed and they didn't get healed. We'll blow God. How often do we allow God to determine what our genuine needs are and how often do we determine it? Or do we allow culture or society to determine what we think human need actually is? How often do we get it right when it comes to need? Jay Walker Smith, who was the president of one of America's biggest marketing firms, uh, he made this statement. He said, we've gone from being exposed to about 500 ads per day in the 70s to about 5,000 ads per day now with online, television, radio, social media, etc. 
from 500 ads per day in the 70s. Those of you that were around in the 70s, you, you probably got about 500 advertisements per day. Today, you're getting 5,000 advertisements thrown at you on average per day. And what are they trying to do? All of these are aimed at one thing, trying to shape our belief about what we need. Aren't they? They're all trying to tell you this is what you need. To be successful, you need this. To make it, you need this. To go there, you need this. To do it, you need this. 5,000 voices screaming at you, saying this is what you need, this is what you need, this is what you need. It's very, very important that we don't get caught up in what culture, society, and the advertising world tells us our needs are when we've got a God who's promised us to meet our needs. I think it's really, really important that we acknowledge that God's the one who has the right to determine what my human needs are, not the world, not society, not the media, not even myself. Amen? God's the one who made me. God's the one who, who legitimizes what a need is and what a need is not. Nothing wrong with having wants. Everybody has wants. I have wants. Lots and lots of wants. Some are probably within reach of me and I just got to make the decision. Do I want it bad enough? What's the cost and so on? Some wants are out of reach of me. The Tigers are not going to win the grand final today. <laughs> They're just not. Unless 15 teams get done for a salary cap breach in the next five hours, it ain't going to happen. And I don't like my chances on that one either. All these things are aimed at one thing, shaping our beliefs about what we need. Matthew 6.32, Jesus says this. He says, for after all these things, what's he talking about, the needs? and stuff. He says, after all these things, the Gentiles seek. In other words, the Gentiles crave, wish, and demand. That's what it means. They crave after it. They crave after. Some translations say they run after all these things. It says, for your heavenly Father knows that you need these things. So, so if, if you're trusting God, you don't have to be craving, running after, chasing these things. What he's saying is this, if you trust me and you get about serving me and I'm your master, all those needs that the world are chasing after, uh, you know, I'll, I'll bring your genuine needs to you. You, you, don't have to. you don't have to be chasing after those things. You can relax, rest, trust in faith. I've got your back. I know that you have needs. I know what your real needs are. If you get on board with me what your real needs are, you'll never be disappointed. You'll never be disappointed. You'll never be disappointed. Because God will not go against his own character, his own nature, his own personality, and break uh, his own word when he's made it very clear that he will provide your needs. God doesn't tell lies. Philippians 4.19, And my God shall supply all your need which literally means in the Greek necessity, all your necessities according to his riches in in, in Christ, according to his riches. God's got a resource bank. I don't know how he does it, but God says, I will meet all of your legitimate needs if you choose to serve me. And if you choose to serve me and get in line with me, you'll know what those legitimate needs are. You'll know I'm meeting them and you'll glorify my name. You'll praise me. You'll have peace. You'll stop chasing after all this other stuff because you'll realize that you probably don't need all this other stuff. Nothing wrong with wanting it, but it's not a need. But all your needs are taken care of by the one that you choose to submit yourself to and the one that you choose to serve because the master looks after the servant. Paul writes this, my God shall supply all your need. He writes this actually from prison. So in other words, in that moment, I can imagine Paul writing that and the question I'd ask Paul is, what do you mean God will provide all your needs? You're in prison right now. How can you say that your God provides all your needs? You're in prison, mate. Maybe Paul would say, well, at this point in time, I don't need to be out. I obviously don't feel like I need to be out. I feel like God's in control. I feel like maybe God's got a plan. I trust him. And if he wants me out, I feel like he can get me out. If that becomes a need to get me out of prison, I believe God can get me out of prison. I've got a mate called Peter. I don't know if you've ever read about it. He's sitting in prison. I think it was Peter. An angel appears, he thinks it's a dream, the chains come off, the gates open up and he walks out. Remember that story? He walks out and next thing he's standing out in the street and he comes to himself and, and, and I mean, crazy, he thought he was dreaming this whole thing and he's standing there in the street going, oh, guess what? That actually happened. Runs up the door, knocks on the door. They, they don't let him in because the older, smart, more mature people, remember the story? A little girl goes up to the door and she, she hears his voice, runs back in, he goes, it's Peter, it's Peter, it's Peter! All excited. And the older, more seasoned, mature believers... They went, it's not Peter, he's in prison, that's why we're here praying for his release. (laughs) There he is, he answered your prayer, he's knocking at your door. No, it can't be Peter because he's in prison, that's why we're praying. Baffles you, doesn't it? But it's in the Bible just to show that they were humans just like us. Humans just like us. 
And I wonder many ditch their faith. They think God never came through. But he always comes through. He cannot not meet your needs. To not meet his children's legitimate needs would be to go against his own character. And God won't go against his own character. The problem is not uh, God failing to deliver on a need. It's our willingness to accept what our genuine needs are. It's our willingness to accept what a genuine need is. Psalm 37 and verse 4. This is what the writer writes. He says, Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. That word delight literally means be delicate, be soft and pliable. That's what it means. Be delicate, soft and pliable in in the hands of God. And what will God do? God will mold and shape you. And what will he shape? He'll change. He'll give you the very desires of your heart. Not the thing is you sitting there going, well, I desire a brand new car. So God, no, no, no. What, it's, what the verse is saying is not God will give you the object of all your desires as you are right now. What he's saying is if you are pliable in the hands of God, God will change you. God will change your very desires themselves so that the things you desire become the things that he wants to bring into your world. That way you never lose. The very desires themselves you stop desiring all that stuff you once desired. Once I wanted to be a famous rock star. Well, you know, I, I wanted to play rugby league for the Balmain Tigers. Only two dreams I ever had. Play rugby league for the Balmain Tigers or be a rock star in a big hair metal band. <laughs> that was it. Outside of that, I didn't really know what else, what, what else was there in life. Between football and music, nothing else. But God changed that. It got on the inside of me. Made pliable and remolded to the point where he changed the very desires themselves. Then I start bringing those desires to God and saying, God, here's what I would like. And God goes, of course you would like it because I put it there. And of course I'm going to meet it because I put it there. And things start to happen in your world. Let God be the one that changes your heart. Let God be the one that molds and shapes the very desires and needs that you have. Because if you get in tune and in line with your needs being the, the needs that God says you have, then you win all the time. You win all the time. So here's how it works. Choose who you're going to serve. Make the choice. It's a decision. Stop sitting back waiting till you have the feeling, oh, I feel like it today, I'm going to follow. Because you won't have the feeling tomorrow and you'll change your mind. Make the choice. Who are you going to serve? And God is so gracious and lovely, he lets us have that choice. Isn't that beautiful? He doesn't force it upon any of us. He says it's your choice. But here's what he says. Know this. Whoever you serve becomes your master. And the master, whoever's your master, becomes your provider. So choose wisely. And if you choose me, here's what I'm going to do. I will provide for you. But what I'm going to do is just change your perspective of what you actually think a real need is. So be prepared to go on a journey with me as I mold and shape you and rechange your desires and bring your desires in line with kingdom desires and with God's desires. And then once that happens, boy, will your spiritual life begin to take off. Because as you begin to pray and trust me and wait on me, all those desires that I've placed in you, you'll see them begin to come to pass. But it starts with the question, who do you want to serve? Who do you want to serve? Because if you choose not to serve Jesus, Matthew chapter 6, put a big black marker right through the whole thing. None of it's going to make sense for you and none of it's going to work. Because it comes back to who do we choose to serve? So two questions I want you to think about this week. Two questions. Number one, who have you chosen to wholeheartedly serve in this life? Is it God or is it somebody else or something else? Who are you serving? Who are you going after? What's your life committed to? Who has the final say in your marriage? Who has the final say in your finances? Who has the final say in what you look at and what you listen to? Who has the final say? Who's the true master of your life? And secondly, who are you looking to in order to determine your needs in this life? Are you looking to culture? Culture tells you you must have this. Is it the society you live in? Is it your friend group, your peer group telling you you've got to have, you've got to be, you've got to do? See, here's how I define a legitimate need. A legitimate need is whatever God says I need to become who he wants me to become and to do what he wants me to do. That's a legitimate need in my life. Whatever I need, whatever needs to come into my world to help me become the person I'm meant to be. And whatever I need to be able to do what it is that God wants me to do. That's my simple definition of what a genuine need is. What do you need to be the person God wants you to be? And what do you need to do the things that he wants you to do as we go about building his kingdom? A couple of questions just for you to think about this week. Father, I want to thank you for this morning. I want to thank you for your word. God, I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're speaking to people here, uh, challenging us. Lord, I pray as we get up 
and we leave this place today, God, we're going to walk out the doors and there's going to be all kinds of noise and, and clamor and activity. But Father, I pray, uh, Holy Spirit, would you just bed that seed deep down in our heart when we walk out here that we wouldn't just forget about it. Go through the next seven days, come back next week and let's hear something else we're going to forget. Lord, I pray that you would plant that seed in our heart. Lord, water it, Holy Spirit. And would you cause us to wrestle with some of these things? Because, Father, deep down inside, we want to be more and more conformed into your image. And, God, with the tiny, tiny speck of dust that our life is here on planet Earth, God, we want to use it for kingdom purposes, God. We want to know that when we get there, you're going to look at us and say, well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into your rest. So, Father, I just commit all these people to you in Jesus' name. I pray in the next seven days as we walk out of this place, God, give every single person in here, everybody that has bowed their knee to Jesus, give every one of them an opportunity in the next seven days to tell somebody about the goodness of God, somebody out there right now that at this point doesn't understand how precious and how loved they are by you and what you did for them on the cross. Give us the chance to tell them in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 God bless you guys.